What, what are you talking about? Okay, this is a sixth hour. This is my sixth hour class lecture for the 28th of uh, April. Uh, well, you know, I don't know what a podcast I mean, I've heard of them, but I've never heard I think you'd be a podcast star. Bro, you go on Joe Rogan. What? I think you'd be a podcast star. Like, you'd be oh, building a good following. Yeah, they make a lot of money too. Well, I'm already on YouTube. That's just almost too much for me. Uh -huh. <laughs> Be a star. Well, Andy's pretty good at like the tech stuff. He probably help you out. Know? I actually went to my 50th, well, 48th class. I didn't go to the 50th. 48th was so depressing, so I didn't go. But, uh, uh, one of my classmates, a girl that I haven't seen for 48 years, lived in New Mexico. This is what she said. I don't know if it's true or not. I don't care. But she said, uh, gee, you know, I really am glad you're teaching. And I said, well, I'm all kinds of time, too. And she said, yeah, she said, I watch your lectures. And she's out in Tucum Carry or someplace in New And I said, What? And she said, Oh, yeah. She said, I see you on YouTube. You reckon that's true? It could I mean, be. She would know how would you know you have a YouTube channel yeah. and you do lectures. So I don't know. It's probably true. It's it makes sense, though, because your videos do have some views on them. They some of them have views. views. Yeah, they do. You need to monetize your channel, make a little bit. That, you, you can't. <laughs> He's got eight subscribers. You know, I could do all that stuff, I guess, but I don't know. It's this thing. I'm too busy reading so I can teach history. Yeah, you know, you know, we live in a world. You know, I heard the other day, you can ask Alex about this, but I was watching Bill Maher, you know, this old time comedian, has a real time on HBO. He's pretty liberal, but I watch his show. You know, he has all kinds of people on there. It's on Friday night at nine o'clock if you've got the, what is that? The, HBO, uh, and that's the only reason I have it to watch him. But he said that it, he was talking. He said at Stanford they have ten thousand. They're talking about he had two college professors on, and they were talking about the high cost of college. You know, and uh, they said at Stanford they have ten thousand administrators, not people teaching students. When I went to college, that's what most people would call it. Most of the people at college that were being paid. That's what they did. They taught students. But these are people sitting in offices administrating. And so they said at Yale, they've got 4,000. And, they, and they're paid higher than the professors. What in the world would 10,000? And that was the question of that. What do they do? And they couldn't come up, they couldn't come up with that answer, which led me to feel, you know, and I think I think the same thing. I think in this computer age, which I'm not even a part of. Uh, but in this computer age, I think if you, you can come up with any kind of program and you can give yourself a title that long, you know, I'm the grand poobah in charge of pencil sharpeners or something that long, and they'll give you an office and probably a secretary and a pretty good paycheck, and, and nobody at the end of the day will really know what you've done. I Why do they have that at the career fair? Huh? I would have jumped all over that at the What's career that? fair. That type of thing. You know, I, I would we'll jump know. all over it. That's what yeah. they're doing. You know, I might not want to be a liar. To hey, look, yeah. hey, let me tell you. But I guarantee you, what they're never, they're, they're never going to come in the classroom to see people like you. They're never going to have to deal with you. You know, no, no, all of us computer illiterates, you know, we're, that, that, that's left to us. You know, that, 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 that's the line. They, they don't want, uh, you know, to, to have to deal with you. So, uh, anyway, are you eating something in here? I found a pretzel. What's in your hand? I found a pretzel. Pretzel? Well, eat that one pretzel and let's look. Be the end of it. I feel like I'm running a bar here. But anyway, <laughs> free uh, pretzels. Anyway, uh, so on with this. So it's my commentary for today. But anyway, um, TED Talks. That basically I was at the Fourth of July celebration. Of course, <laughs> you're a history teacher. They start asking you history, and the reason they ask you is they want to ask you something that you don't know. You know, they, they, they think they'll really get you. Well, of course, how they're all kinds of things. I don't know anything about Asia, much about Asian history. I'm an American history. So you, know, you can ask me all sorts of questions. History is history's everything. Ask me about physics. That's history. I don't know anything about it. But anyway, they got me on the Constitution. I do know a little bit about that. And so I talked to him about the Constitution. I thought it was pretty appropriate for the 4th of July. And uh, that's what one of them told me. They said, man, you ought to go on. He was a student at Northeastern. I said, you ought to go on TED Talk. Is that a deal? Just the thing like yeah. 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 the They give friends they people like an hour to talk about whatever they want. An hour. I don't have time. Well, all right. Get this down. We're today. We're gonna forget that nonsense and talk about 
one of the most famous states in the United States history. And some of you are going to be up there. I'm going to show you some pictures of this battlefield. But if you don't go with me, go sometime. And all you got to do is drive up there. You know, you're not going to the moon if you drive to America, uh, where this battle is. Uh, I guarantee you, if you cross the Arkansas line heading east from Missouri, your, your oxygen won't come be cut off because you left Oklahoma. Anyway, well, um, Lee, three months after the Battle of the Peninsula, Lee persuaded Jefferson Davis to let him uh, invade the North. And so he divided his army into three corps, and he crossed uh, into uh, the Potomac River into Maryland. He was not intending to fight in Maryland. You should have never heard about a battle called the Battle of Antietam. He was going to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And there he was going to sit and wait like a cougar to pounce on the Union Army when it came out of Washington, D.C., looking for him. And again, he had three generals in charge of his armies and three corps, C-O-R-P-S, three corps, and he gave each one of them his battle plan. This is what we're going to do. And it shows where it showed where the troops were located. It showed their movements for the next few days. And it's Special Order 191. We did that right. And that ended up in a, a Union corporal named John Bloss uh, from Indiana found that. The chances of doing that was, were one in 10 trillion. Uh, but uh, and it, plus it had been rain, should have been rained on in the ink run and nobody should have even if he did. But anyway, the stars aligned. And he found that and he took it to McClellan. And now McClellan had Lee's entire battle plan sitting right there. He knew that Lee's. Uh, and by the way, McClellan has ninety to maybe a hundred thousand men. Uh, Lee's coming across with about fifty thousand. He started with sixty thousand. Ten thousand refused to go into the north. They just said we're not going and stayed in Virginia. So Lee's got about 50,000, and he's got about 35,000 men with him. And then the rest of them are divided between his two other corps. One's at a place called White Mountain, and one's at a place called Harper's Ferry. And I'm not even going to deal with that. I'm just going to stick with uh, Antietam. Uh, but anyway, uh, now McClellan knew where Lee was. And Lee had just crossed the Potomac River. He had just crossed uh, the Potomac River into Maryland. There's Antietam. He had just crossed that. And as soon as he gets across, there comes this big rain, uh, and the Potomac River is flooded, and even if he wanted to retreat, he couldn't get across. So he's here at Sharpsburg, okay? He's here at Sharpsburg, uh, and McClellan moves uh, toward him, okay, with 90,000 men. And McClellan, um, and I think I've got a little bit better map for you today. McClellan is going to come up to Antietam Creek. This battle fought from the north to the south. He's going to come up to Antietam Creek, and he's got Lee hemmed in between Antietam Creek, and here you see the Potomac River, which would have flowed here. And Lee's headquarters are in Sharpsburg, lovely little town. We'll pass through that on the way to the battlefield this summer. But uh, he's at Sharpsburg, and he's got 38,000 men uh, strung out from this little church. I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. This little church, Dunford Church, there were a bunch of German pacifists there, and they all of the churches around here sprinkled you when you were baptized, but these people believed that you had to be taken down to Antietam Creek and just dunked all the way under. So their detractors called them dunkers. So that's Dunker Church. Right now, Dunker Church, because I'm going to ask you to identify landmarks in these battles on your next test. <coughs> Dunker Church. All the way down here to this place called Snavely's Ford, all right, and Burnside's Bridge, okay? So here's Lee's left flank, here's Lee's right flank, and of course there's a sunken road, which today is called Bloody Lane, right in the center, right in front of Sharpsburg. And Lee's got about 38,000 men spread out there, and McClellan's troops come up just like this, from the north uh, and from the east, and they're parked along um, Antietam Creek, 100,000 men maybe. And, of course, all he had to say was forward march. Hit Lee everywhere at once, and he would have destroyed Lee. He would have driven him into the Potomac River, and the war might have been over. But he didn't. This battle is going to be fought in three distinct phases. It's going to be fought up here in the north, around Dunker Church in the cornfield, the east wood and the west wood. It's going to be fought up here <coughs> from about 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. And, and then the fighting stops there. These two... Uh, the troops up here 
fight each other to a frazzle, uh, and then it stops. And then the fight's going to move to the center of the line uh, from about uh, 11 o'clock until about 2 o'clock. Uh, the northern forces are going to try and break through here, and they do achieve a breakthrough of the source. I'm going to talk about this in detail, but uh, McClellan doesn't take advantage of that. And finally, the last fighting of the day will take place around from 2.30 to about 4 o'clock. And I'll show you a picture of this. This is one of the most beautiful places in America in my definition of beauty. Uh, and they will try and storm across this bridge and uh, crush Lee's right flank. And so one, two, three. That's how the battle, that's how the battle is going to unfold. And so the bloodiest day, and by the way, because McClellan attacks piecemeal. He fights here, then pulls back. Then he fights here. Because of that, Lee, get this down, could uh, use what are called in military strategy uh, in his interior lines, okay? In other words, he could shift troops. He's outnumbered, but he could shift troops where he needed them. He could shift those troops back and forth. Because if McClellan had hit him all at once is what he should have done. He just should have, he had that order, he should have come up and crushed him if McClellan would have hit him everywhere at once, uh, there's no way that Lee had enough men to cover his bases. And so the bloodiest day in U.S. history began about 7 a.m. on September 17, 1862. This man, I'll be coming back to this map. This man, writing down, Joseph Hooker, Joe Hooker, Fighting Joe. He, he, at this battle, he earns the nickname Fighting Joe Hooker because he gets shot in the foot at this battle, okay? Uh, he was probably so drunk he didn't feel the ball go in his foot. He's an alcoholic. He's got a beet red nose. He's a big, tall, blonde-headed guy. Uh, he was considered handsome according to the standards of the day. And he receives his orders to attack uh, out of the Westwood and the Eastwood to come across this cornfield to Dunker Church, okay? The Confederates, you can see, are right here uh, along the cornfield in Dunker Church. By the way, Here's Dunker Church. So far as I know, it's open 24 hours a day. That's where we start the tour. Uh, there's a road right here, and, and the cornfields just right across the road here. And back there, you can see the Westwood, and then, of course, there you can see the beginning of the Eastwood. All this is pretty compact, but that's where we start the tour. We go in there, and I talk to them a little bit about the battles there, and then we move on. But there's uh, Dunker Church, okay? There it stands. Uh, it witnessed that battle. Uh, and so the Union forces come through the Eastwood, the Westwood, Hooker, Mansfield, Sumner, Charles Sumner, uh, uh, another Charles Sumner, uh, not, what is that? anyway, Sumner, Franklin, uh, they come across trying to cave in Lee's uh, right flank, or left flank. But, of course, you see here, among other Confederate generals, he's got Jackson. And usually, you know, if Jackson was given a spot to hold, if Jackson was given... If Jackson was given, given a spot to hold, uh, he could hold it. And he held that day. And for two hours, they fought all over that church. And some of the worst fighting, get this down, some of the worst fighting was in that 24-acre cornfield. Uh, in fact, uh, up here, you see the cornfield. Uh, up here, north and a little bit east of the cornfield, uh, the Union forces had put uh, a battery of cannons up there. Battery B, I think of the Ohio artillery, I think Ohio, and the corn at this point is about head high, okay? Uh, it's ready to be harvested. It's September. Uh, and uh, the Union forces, and by the way, there's the, there's the cornfield. There's uh, The Miller family still lives on that farm. They still own it. They still plant it just like it was the day of the battle. If you're standing there looking at that fence, if you're looking across that fence, you're looking at Dunker Church, okay? So it's that close. And so these uh, Union forces are up here, uh, we're about where this barn is, and they've got a cannon. They've got those cannons packed with grape shot. Uh, and the Confederates, uh, you know, sustain an attack. They drive back the Union forces, but then they're going to send in their troops to take that battery. And uh, the, the troops that were just arriving on the field uh, were the 1st Texas, okay? A regiment, the 1st Texas. And they had just arrived at Antietam. They were a little late getting there. And they had sat down, and they were kindling fires to start cooking the first hot meal they had had in three days. And they had just got, in other words, they promised them, we're going to let you eat before you fight. And boy, you know, they hadn't had a hot meal in three days. And so they 
start cooking that meal, and right when they're about to take it off the fire, they say, form up ranks. And oh, they're just as mad as hell. You know, form up ranks. And so these Texans form up the ranks, and they say, we're going to get this over real quick. And they go storming through that cornfield, and that's a union company, but that's what it would have looked like. You know, and the, and the, that Northern Battery, again, the, consider these, put these guys in gray uniforms and make that a Confederate flag. That Northern Battery up there, uh, they couldn't see the men coming through the cornfield. It was like fighting in the elephant grass in Vietnam. You could hear the enemy out there, but you never could see. And so here they come, uh, and those Northerners aren't going to take any chances, and they just unleash on that cornfield with that grape shot. And they just, 80% uh, of those Texans went back, 80% of them. And they're just, they're just massacred there. Uh, that cornfield becomes a slaughter pit. Five times. And so the Confederates are driven back. Then the Northern troops attack, and the Confederates drive them back. That cornfield changed hands five times that day, and neither side uh, gained advantage. To show you how bloody this is, the fighting up around Dunker Church in the Eastwood, the Westwood, and Farmer Miller's, corn spit, cor Farmer Miller's cornfield last about two and a half hours. And there were 12,000 killed and wounded in two and a half hours. We couldn't, listen, today if we got word that from any quarter of the world, you, the U.S. Army was engaged in fighting, and in two and a half hours, 12,000 men would have, have gone, we couldn't comprehend that. We couldn't comprehend that. And that's just the opening dance at the Battle of Antietam. 12,000 go down in two and a half hours. But by 10.30, by, by the way, they said you can walk across, it's almost 30 acres, they said you could walk across that cornfield and not touch the ground. Literally, it was just stuffed with dead, dead and wounded men. Uh, not touch the ground. Chief Justice, you remember, I've been telling the, my sophomore history class this, you remember Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in the case of Sheep versus the United States? He was 92 when he decided that case. He, he was a young lieutenant out there in that cornfield and around Dunker Church, and he, he, he was 19 years old, and he had just led his troops on an assault against the Confederates. He was in the Union Army. He was a Massachusetts man. And he, uh, when they got the order to pull back, you know, there, it was just, just a bloodbath, pull back, he turned and he was running with his men back past Dunker Church. And officers in those days wore these high stiff collars and a bullet came and tore his collar off right there. And if it had just been a shade over, it would have hit his carotid artery and he would have bled to death in about two minutes. Uh, but anyway, it wounded him. He knocked him down. He, uh, and later on that afternoon, he regains consciousness and he's just surrounded by all these dead bodies and he crawls out. But he kept that uniform, that jacket he was wearing that day for the rest of his life. And he lived a long life, 94, 95 years old. But he was there. That was his baptism by fire. Chief Justice Holmes was wounded in, in the bloodiest day in the United States history. By 10.30 in the morning, I'm going to go shifting back here. By 10.30 in the morning, they're all, they stop. They're all fought out. And what did Stonewall Jackson do when he noticed the Union troops pulling back? Hmm? Oh, he sat down under a tree and took a nap. Can you, can you, how could you sit down in the midst of all this carnage? Dead bodies blown apart everywhere. Yeah, uh, he took a nap. I just always amazed me about Jackson. That's the cornfield. That's the orange road. By the way, see that road? It's a much better road today. That runs right, there it is. You can see that runs right in front of, it's paved today, runs right in front of that church. So right across begins Farmer Miller's cornfield, okay? That. And there are dead Confederates killed in the fighting at the cornfield, okay? I know that's a pretty blurry picture, but there's some dead Confederates. Uh, I have another picture here. I don't know what's happened to my pictures. But uh, anyway, today when you go to this church, when you get up there, right across the road, they have, I think, three Confederate cannons there uh, aimed up at the woods. And this church was damaged during the fighting and later catches fire and burns. But anyway, part of it. But anyway, so the fighting stopped. At about 10.30 in the morning, you get this down. Now it's going to shift quickly. Now it's going to shift to the middle of the line here. I need to move this map more than once. So it stops here. So now it shifts here to the center of the line. I write this man's name down.
This was a sunken farm road, okay? It had been used for 200 years, well, 150 years. Sunken road, and it was a natural trench. And that man right there, Daniel Harvey Hill, I talked about, he's the guy at Malvern Hill, right? Daniel Harvey Hill, tough as a boot. There's it, there it is. See, that's a natural trench. And that fence is up on it. And what these Confederates are going to do is they're going to lay down right there and the Union forces are going to attack. And there's a little bit better picture, okay? A little bit better picture of it. Uh, and that's called the Sunken Road. Write that down. And so many people have died at the Sunken Road that it's called Bloody Lane. So now the fighting shifts to the center, the fighting sh shifts to the center of the line. And there were 2,000 Confederates out there to hold that part of the line. 2,000 Confederates. And just across the way, just, you could lay, you could, they could lay, uh, they could, uh, lay down right here and they could look about from here to maybe where those houses are right up here on the hill from the school and they could see the Union troops. And uh, there were 30,000 Union troops there, okay? And those 30,000 Union troops were backed by 40,000 more Union troops, okay? Here, let's just think about this. When you talk about what kind of generals in the club, just remember this. 40,000 Union soldiers in this battle. 40,000 of them never fired their guns at that. He held 40,000 in reserve because he was scared to death that Lee was going to a counterattack because he believes that Lee has more men, that Lee has him out number. So he held 40,000 troops, 40,000 troops back. DHL was down there with 2,000 men. By the way, he had just ridden up on his horse and uh, the Union artillery was starting to fire. It spooked his horse and his horse reared up and he just held on his horse. He was a natural horseman and a cannonball came along and uh, shot the front legs off of his horse. Okay, and his horse tumbled down. He takes a roll and the typical DHL style, he just got up, called for another horse. But uh, Lee comes up to him. And by the way, Robert E. Lee that day is riding around in an ambulance. So he had wagons. He's riding around in an ambulance. And uh, the reason for that is, is he can't hold the reins of his horse. And the reason for that is, is that uh, on the way uh, up to uh, uh, Maryland, his horse had stumbled. Uh, and he fell off, and when he started to fall, he, he tried to brace his fall with his hands, and he broke both of his hands. So his hands are bandaged, and he's riding around commanding his army in this ambulance. He rode up to DHL, and he told DHL, this, ma'am, would you stop drawing? That's distracting me. I would appreciate that. I'll do that in our class. Anyway, back to what I was saying. Uh, he rides up, and... Uh, in this ambulance, and he told DHL this. He said, it's all come down to you. If these Union forces break through here, and there was every indication that they were, they will win. They will cave in the center of our line. This hill, this must be held at all, all costs. And Hill Salute said, we will hold it at all costs. And so the attack started. And here's some, that's a really good picture of Bloody Lane. Uh, and the Confederates are, this is their fire that way. Uh, and uh, when these Union forces come across these open fields, I don't know what's going to happen now. When these Union forces come across these open fields, get this down, the Confederate soldiers slaughter. I mean, it's, it's a bloodbath. It's a bloodbath. And D.H. Hill is holding. But this man is there, too. You don't have to write him down, but this is just too good a story. He was sort of D.H. Hill's second in command. And his name was John B. Gordon. By the way, the Confederates have such a shortage of men there to face these thousands of Union soldiers. The DHL that day, a full general, this doesn't happen, a full general, DHL that day, fought in that road with a musket, just like a private. And they didn't have a man to spare. This guy's there, and he's standing in that road by that fence commanding his troops that are laying down there shooting, and he's going to get shot five times. First shot, Took off a piece of his elbow, and his men said, General, go to the rear. And he said, No, we can't spare anybody. And another bullet hits him in the calf, and then, you know, he won't go. And another bullet hits him in the shoulder, and he won't go. And another bullet hits him somewhere else, and he won't go. And he's losing, losing blood all the, all the, uh, the time. And as he's commanding, you know, here come the Union troops as he's commanding like that. The fifth bullet went through his jaw, okay? and blew his teeth out the other side of his face. 
and he falls. He said, that doesn't. He's lost so much blood. He's like John B. Gordon. Well, not, I think he's Georgia. John B. Gordon. He falls. He goes to fall, and he's falling face down. Uh, and as, as he fell, his cap slipped. He wasn't wearing a hat. His cap slipped over his face, and he fell face first into that cap like that. And he would have drowned. He was bleeding profusely. He would have drowned in his own blood, except for just before that bullet went through his jaw, another bullet passed through the crown of his hat. And that blood drained out of the two holes in his hat, and that's what saved him from drowning in his own blood. And so then they get him, and they take him back to an aid station. Don't worry about him. He lives 30 more years. So uh, he, he is elected the governor of Georgia. And then later he serves in the United States Senate. I think he was 90 something when he died. What happened to his stuff? What happened to his seat? They like sewed him up. Hmm. And he probably didn't have any. I'm talking about, yeah, what, what are they? Any dumb students? What do they call them? No, the motors are down here. Aren't they? Anyway, this, whatever they are, the top row up here, the bullet came like that, blew them out that side of his face. So he probably ate a lot of soup. I don't know. What was the Miller family doing while like, all this is happening? Well, that's Where a good question. Ate? I don't know the answer to that. I know they didn't fight the battle. Uh, they probably were down, you know, they built houses in those days as basements. They were probably down in the basement. I don't know. They might have been out trying to save vacation. Hey, that cornfield theirs, that 30 acre, 24 acre cornfield, it was cut level. Five times, you know, with, by the artillery, and it caught on fire. Some of the wounded are going to be burned to death. It's cut; it's just little stubs about that high. So they lost their corn crop. I'd be so mad. Were they reimbursed by the government? No, no. The government didn't do things like that. In those days. <laughs> Sorry, you know, we got to yeah. save the union. You know, yeah. hey, they really just had to go out there and probably pick up the bodies and stuff. Huh? Like, well, that? hey, when Lee goes to Gettysburg. In June of 1860, talking about bodies, June of 1863, when Lee goes to Gettysburg, those Confederate soldiers march right through Antietam, going back to Harrisburg. This time they make it all the way to Pennsylvania. And uh, there were, you know, it'd be, there's a torso and a head, skeleton sticking up where they had buried you, you know, the rain had washed it away, or you sat up, you know, dead bodies do strange things. Well, they were all over the place. For 50 years, they carried away the bones of horses and men at Antietam. At Gettysburg, Lincoln, you know, this is horrible. At Gettysburg, you know, everything's so sanitized now. But at Gettysburg, um, when, you know, it's in July of 1863. Lincoln doesn't go down to make his speech until November of 1863. The stick that you could still smell rotting dead bodies in November of 1863, that they just, they just hadn't gotten rid of. I mean, they hadn't buried it. There were 56,000 killed and wounded at Gettysburg in three days, okay? And you could still, 10 miles from Gettysburg, you could smell the stench of death, okay? It was a horrible, horrible war. Well, anyway, finally, get this down, the Union forces managed to break through uh, at Bloody Lane. But the Union forces were so fought out, you with me? They couldn't advance. And when they finally get in, here's what they, I've left out. Here's Bloody Lane. And here are the Confederates firing at, well, firing at the Union forces attacking. You know, they just slaughter them. The Union forces are, dead bodies are stacked up in front of that fence. And finally, you know, a lot of times soldiers are smarter than their generals. Finally, some corporal or sergeant or something says, this is just fine. You know, and he tells a group of his men, follow me. And they go down here to the end of the lane. And they look, and there are all those Confederates firing, and they're down there, and they don't notice it. And they signal some more men, and, they, and finally some other guys go around here. And then they catch the Confederates in the crossfire, and they slaughter the Confederates. And the, Confederate, and the Confederates retreat. And the whole center, you with me? The whole center of the Confederate line opens. But those Union forces are so fought out, they've been through hell, they get in that bloody lane, and they just... <laughs> collapsed. And they look back. They look back from where they'd come, and they can see the eagles. You know, this is rolling. When you get up there, you'll see it. It's rolling country. You know, when these Union forces would attack, they would be marching and then all of a sudden they'd go out of sight and they'd come back up. Well, you look back there, and you, they can see the eagles on top of the American flags. 
There were 20,000 troops that never fought standing back there. And these Union soldiers are standing up, waving their arms, going, come on, come on, we punched the hole through. Come on, and we'll win. And they would have won the battle. And McClellan wouldn't commit. He said, no, Lee's up to something. Sneaky Lee. And plus, he's got more men than I do. And so those 20,000 men sat back there, and they never took advantage of the gaping hole in the center of the Union line. Well, finally, the final act. By the way, there's a picture of Bloody Lane. The dead body. And they said you could walk a mile and not touch the ground. Does McClellan have any statues? You need to take these statues down. <laughs> and he's terrible. I don't know. You know. That is a maybe. Maybe we, maybe we should. Uh, maybe we should start old tissues. Go find a deal. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know any McClellan statues. Such a thing may exist. Uh, he was the most Ambrose. Well, it's going to end the final act of uh, so. Back to this map. I, I need to put some more maps in there. Maybe I will. So they failed here. You know, here they are. They punch through. The troops are back here. They won't come up. And so these men just lay exhausted in the trench. And finally, at about two or two thirty, uh, McClellan orders. You know, he could have just said, for, and they would have won. They would have captured Lee and the whole kit and caboodle of the trick. But now, he says, you're going to cross the, he orders General Ambrose Everett Burnside. You know, we saw him that. Uh, hair on the side of your face became stylish because of him. And uh, that became known as Sideburns, okay? The inversion of General Burnside's name. It's about all he ever accomplished. Uh, but anyway, they tell him, go across that bridge and hit the Confederate right flank and roll up the right flank. And there's that bridge. There he is. There's that bridge. That, that is, there it is. There it is. That's one of the most beautiful places. And that tree right there, they call it the tree. It was there on the day of the Battle of Antietam. Okay. Uh, and so what, and there's Antietam Creek. Beautiful. And when you're there, you'll see people rowing up and down it, you know, rowing, people swimming, it, you know. But on September 17th, Burnside's men were over here and they told him to cross that bridge and up here on these heights looking down on them, all these got left are 500 Georgia sharpshooters up there. That's it. And uh, uh, that's the view those sharpshooters have looking down at that bridge. Now you might think McClellan would deploy his men and let them cross the creek, you know, and then regroup on the other side of the creek and then storm up there and cut, but he didn't. He lined them up, four across, four soldiers across. And he put a band, well, drummers down here, and maybe a guy playing a flute. And uh, he marched them across, four across. And so those 500 Confederate sharpshooters up there, all they had to do was concentrate on where these people are walking right here, right on the end of this bridge. And it's just going to be another slot. So many men are killed crossing that bridge that their bodies fall off. And by the way, Antietam Creek is no small thing. When you get up there and see it, we'd call it a river in Oklahoma. But uh, that's a creek back east. But so many bodies fell in that creek that it dammed up the creek, literally dammed it up. Finally, they wouldn't go across, and they started, they had to offer. They said, "No, you know, we're not going to do it." <laughs> and so they offered. This tells you a lot about 19th century Americans. They said, "If you go across, if you get across, we'll give you free whiskey." And they formed up their ranks and charged across, and this time they get across. And late in the day, at about four o'clock, that's a true story. Late in the day, at about four o'clock, the North achieves a breakthrough here, right here. They come across that bridge, they go up those heights, they drive those Georgians back, and they're driving, more and more Northerners are getting across, and they're driving toward. Sharpsburg. Lee is up in a church steeple, the tallest building in Sharpsburg, and he's got his binoculars. He's looking off here. He's looking off here to the west, uh, the north, because he had sent early that morning. He had sent word to a, uh, one of his generals, General A. P. Hill, saying, "Come on, the battle is here." And A. P. Hill, at that moment, just when the North is about to achieve a breakthrough, A. P. Hill will arrive. There he is. Okay. A.P. Hill will, will arrive with 10,000 troops. Uh, he had started out with something like 18,000, 
Uh, but he marched them so hard that six or eight thousand of them were strung out along the road, uh, throwing up and trying to catch their breath. Some of them had, uh, you know, fainted or whatever. But he makes it with about 10,000 men. And just when the North finally achieves this breakthrough at about four o'clock in the afternoon, he throws these 10,000 men in there and they stop the advance. And that's the end of the battle. That's the end of the battle of Antigua. Did the men uh, that make it get the free whiskey? I'm sorry? Did the men that made it across Burnside Bridge get free whiskey? They did. And what is McClellan? And I hate to tell you that. I don't want to tell you this. Uh, it was an Irish brigade. No. No. My people. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. You know, normal people wouldn't cross for whiskey, but that makes sense. Irish are normal people. Yeah, Irish are normal people. What's the matter with you? Anyway, <laughs> it's old Grant, General old Grant. Grant was a Scotsman. Anyway, uh, descended from Scotsman. Anyway, that was it. And uh, there were 4,000, 4,808 men dead. Almost 5,000 fell in one day. Wounded were everywhere. The dead were everywhere. Lee held his position. Some of his officers said, let's get the heck out of here. And let's risk crossing the river. Lee said, no, he held his position all day long on the 18th, daring McClellan to attack. You know, and McClellan should have attacked. He could have won on the second day. But what is McClellan? Just scared. You know, we've mean, had it. It's over. Terrible. We've had it. Well, which McClellan said, I stopped this invasion. You know, here, I stopped the invasion. I saved my country for a second time. That's essentially what he said. And Lee dared him. And Lee didn't want to leave and fight. Now, this tells you a lot about Lee after this bloodbath. I mean, I, I don't know how people kept their sanity going through this. But Lee wants to cross the river, Potomac, go down the Potomac, cross back over, and hit McClellan again. And his officers just go, no, no, you know, General, we've got to get out of here. We've barely escaped. We've barely escaped with our uh, skins. That's how aggressive Lee was. Um, 4,808 men dead. Hey, listen, that's more in one day. That's just, let me put this in some sort of perspective for you. That's more in one day than the United States lost in the War of 1812, the Mexican War, and the Spanish American War combined. We lost more men in one day than we, than, than we lost in three of the nation's wars. As I say, the Confederates barely escaped with their skins. They were fought to a brazil. In fact, some say, and I tend to be one of those people that say this, I don't think Lee's army ever recovered. Ever recovered from that. Hundreds deserted. The Confederate cavalry uh, couldn't do reconnaissance against the enemy because Lee had his cavalry strung out all across southern Maryland and northern Virginia, uh, arresting arresting deserters. Uh, there were, you know, the, the, these guys just say enough is enough. There are dead men and horses everywhere. Houses, barns, this is farm country, tents, stores, schoolhouses were made into makeshift uh, hospitals. Think about this. You know, what if some disaster happened in Tulsa tomorrow and 20,000 people were injured? Do they have the medical facilities to deal with that? What about Dallas? Dallas doesn't have that. And here you've got this little country town. It's the size of you fall. Do they have the facilities? They absolutely, they absolutely do not. So just everywhere that they can treat a wounded person, they did. And I want you to write this woman down. She... Eden Cohen, come to the office, please. There were... At Antietam, there were 19,000 wounded, 4,000 killed and 19,000 wounded. Claire Bar Barton and her nurse, when you leave that church, you go up to a road called Mansfield Road, and then you turn, uh, you turn uh, uh, east, yeah, you turn east, and there's a monument there, and it's in honor of Claire Barton. I, I think she's the only woman that has the monument uh, on a Civil War battle. But I want to just say this about her. You know, she wasn't back behind the lines of the barn waiting for the wounded to be brought to her. She's right up there in the tent at the cornfield. Uh, and she's so close to the body, and I'm at those you just sort of walk in the parish telling you again. She had a Union soldier up like this. And he's sitting up and she's pressing a comp. He's had a chest wound. She's pressing a chest compress there on him, uh, trying to stop the bleeding. You see those big puff sleeves there. Uh, and while she's doing that, a bullet comes through the side of the tent, passed through one of her sleeves, and shot him and killed him. 
mean, that's how close she was to the action. I say if anybody deserves a monument on the battlefield, she certainly she certainly does. Claire Claire Bars. By the way, we'll go on to uh, to uh, found the American Red Cross, which helps out which helps out today. Well, uh, get this down. It's a standoff. Uh, but I think the North can claim victory because Lee's state of aim. You know, when you're trying to determine who won a battle, you've got to look at both sides and say, what were they trying to accomplish? Lee was trying to accomplish a, a successful invasion of the North and failed. So I think technically the North can say, uh, technically the North can say they won. It wasn't the most clear cut victory. Technically it was a draw, but it was close enough to Lincoln. Lincoln said this. I'm going to say, he told his cat that I'm going to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. Get that down. Five days after this battle, he signs the Emancipation Proclamation. He wanted to do it as soon as the war began, but his cabinet said, no, we've got to win a clear-cut victory. Because if we sign the Emancipation Proclamation while we're being defeated, the rest of the world will look at us and say, it looks as if we're trying, we can't win the war, and so we're trying to free the slaves so they'll rise up and kill their masters. Uh, it'll look like we're trying to institute a race war and the whole world will turn against us. They said, you got to wait till the victory. And Lincoln waited and waited and waited. And he tells them, this is close enough. And so when we come back, we'll talk about the Emancipation Proclamation. <coughs> How do you first continue farming on a piece of land where 4,000 people were? How do you what? How do you continue farming on a piece of land for a thousand people? Or just... work, you don't work. Well, they got to move. Oh, you've been here all day, aren't you? 
Thank <laughs> you. 